Welcome to the last episode of Series 12, everyone! Not only that, but this is our 50th released episode! What? What? 50 episodes, Ryan. We did it! Shut That's it down! Amazing. We did it! That's half Mission of accomplished. 100. <laughs> <laughs> so, since April of last year, we have been working a lot on planning new episodes, recording with amazing people, while we created amazing people with them, and getting to know some of all of you better on Twitter and on Discord. We even got to meet some people in person at a Catacon, and I also got to meet a couple people at Gen Con last year. We are looking forward to meeting people at Gen Con again this year. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be good. It's, it's been good. It is gonna be good. Yeah, yeah. And I am sure once we hit that one year mark, we're gonna, we're gonna be doing a full walkthrough memory lane. But once you're done with this series, feel free to check out some of the other series on the backlog if you had skipped over them previously. On to our actual normal <laughs> cold open <laughs> announcements. Please don't forget that Gen Con tickets are on sale. Uh, both Ryan and I have our tickets and we can't wait to meet more of you there. We are planning on running at least one panel so far and I know Ryan is planning on running a few games of Chimera over the weekend. I have a couple possible panels uh, that I might be joining in on so mm -hmm. please find us come say hi you know tweet at us whatever we would love to talk <laughs> to you if you are going to be there um yes it's you are the whole reason that we are driving to indianapolis otherwise mm -hmm. uh it would not be worth it mm -hmm. just kidding yeah, we're... There. <laughs> <laughs> my friends are there sorry too. indianapolis your city smells bad <laughs> Oh, poor Aww, city. It does. <laughs> well, <laughs> another announcement is that we are currently working on getting actual transcripts for our episodes done. Uh, we have episode zero done as a proof of concept and have added a link to those transcripts in the show notes for episode zero. Uh, and we're running into some issues getting that link added to the one-shot page notes. Uh, but at the very least in the podcatcher, it should be all set. Finally, it's been great having you along for the ride for these last 50 episodes. If you're just joining us, welcome! We are super happy yeah. to have you here with us. We would love to hear where everyone heard about our podcast and how you prefer to listen so you can hit us up on twitter at creationcast and let us know yeah and another great way to let us know what you think of the podcast is to leave a rating and review we have links in the show notes to apple podcasts stitcher and facebook and these are the best places for us to find reviews so take a moment to do so if you haven't already it uh, it really helps us with the rankings and helps others find the show easier ryan i do promise that i read these before we started recording but i do want to add one more thing to our already really yeah. long cold open <laughs> uh <laughs> Shadow of the Cabal is coming back for a second season of L5R stuff, which I am actually a part of this time. Mm -hmm. uh, so Song of the Crane, S-O-T-C, uh, part two, we begin with our episode zero and character creation on January 31st. Yay. Yay! And then the actual first episode will come out on February 1st. Our episode zero and character creation has some spoilers, and there'll be a warning in the episode too. So if you don't like spoilers, don't listen to that one. But I'm super excited for people to hear what we've recorded. Like we, it's it's so much fun. I'm looking forward to playing more, and like Ooh. it's gonna. Oh my gosh, you guys are gonna love it. It's so good. It's so good. I, I I might actually start listening. Well, you can start from the beginning. You don't have to catch up on the other 47 <laughs> episodes. You know. This I is, know. So if you've been waiting on Shadow of the Cabal and thinking L5R sounds fun, but 47 episodes, that's ridiculous. Have I got a deal for you? <laughs> okay. So, with all of those announcements and things out of the way, <laughs> announcements and feelings, if you know someone that would enjoy our show, please let them know about us. It would be cool to see more people enjoying what we're doing, plus it would help us out. So for now, we will let you know what other people think about us, and we will read our latest <laughs> and, you guys, final review. Mm -hmm. We need more. So this one is from Bradley Man 612 of the United States. It's titled The Best Parts. A podcast for anyone whose favorite part of the RPG is making characters. So most of us. 
the information about the games played that becomes apparent in the discussion is more informative than I imagined it would be. Also, everyone enjoying themselves makes for an excellent podcast. Thank you so much, Bradley Man. Thank you. I think with all of that, we will just go ahead and leave it off here. I think it's been long enough. <laughs> Please enjoy the last of my exasperation in uh-huh. Heroes Unlimited. <laughs> Welcome back to our discussion episode. Last time, we created a group of characters for my favorite, Heroes Unlimited. This episode, we will be discussing the character creation process. We are very excited to welcome back Jeff and John from System Mastery. Do you want to go ahead and introduce yourselves again for everyone at home and tell us a little bit about the characters that you made on our last episode? Jeff, how about we start with you? You got it. Uh, Once again, I'm Jeff from the System Mastery Expounded Universe and Movie Mastery Podcast, which you can find at SystemMasteryPodcast.com. Joined, as always, by my co-host, John. Let's see, the character I made, and I've just grabbed random scribbly notes instead of my character for reasons I (laughs) I can't... I made my character on on an online fillable PDF. Okay, I made a character who randomly rolled up that he is an alien uh, from from far away outer space. Uh, I named him Absolut Unite. Uh, he is... <laughs> I forgot uh, about that. Uh, uh-huh. Absolut <laughs> Unite. Uh, he is, he's an elephant man. Uh, describing the process by which this character came to exist would take hours, so let's just go simply. He is an elephant person from a low-gravity world. On an average day, he is 11 foot 7 inches tall, uh, but when he needs to power up to go into combat, he rapidly grows to 15 feet tall. He weighs hundreds of pounds, uh, eight, eighths of hundreds of pounds, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and his superhero name is Event Horizon. Uh, the reason he came by this superhero name instead of something elephant related is because his powers line up in a very black holeish fashion. Uh, his his uh, three powers, two major and one minor, are weight manipulation, which allows him to control the weight of nearby objects by uh, launching a sort of attack at them that can raise or drop their, their uh, total weight of the unit that I target by 100 pounds at a time. Darkness control, which lets him create darkness localized or in in uh, big areas uh, of which he can personally see through. So even if he surrounds himself completely with pitch darkness, he can see fine. And energy expulsion light, which lets him fire off beams of brilliant white light uh, that can blind people. They're the last gasps of things escaping from the event horizon. Uh, he is a smuggler from an intergalactic ring of elephant smugglers, uh, which is way cooler than it sounds. Yeah, they don't they smuggle are, elephants. Uh, they're, they're, they're not say. elephant smugglers. No, they're 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 smugglers <laughs> who are elephants, or or whatever the alien species name. I I didn't actually come up with one. Uh, pachydermions. Yeah, oh, yeah. That beautiful. sounds that sounds comic booky enough. Yeah. So the pachydermions. Uh, he, from pachydermia nine. From pachydermia nine. Pachydermia eight. All hippos. <laughs> Uh, so he he managed to escape the uh, the smuggling ring that he had originally joined, but felt that he didn't fit in. He was just too nice of a person. Not only that, but he's just a blabbermouth. He uh, he talks too much to be a good smuggler in an elephant smuggling ring. Uh, once again, I mean a, a smuggling ring comprised mainly of elephants, uh, pachydermions. Uh, he, but he did like Earth just on a, a cursory glance, and so he decided to, when he was leaving his intergalactic smuggling ring, uh, take some of the most recent loot and hide it there, and then lay, lay low there to, to kind of dodge the heat while it all blew over. He smuggled about 100,000 American dollars worth of fancy alien <laughs> equipment and technology. Thereabouts. Thereabout, give or take. Uh, but unfortunately, at least one small piece of alien technology got away from him, uh, a, a, a vial of, a, of a mysterious alien chemical n- unknown even to his species, uh, which uh, fell out from his escape pod during a rocky crash landing and disappeared from his sight. Uh, but before it did, it cracked. The vial cracked and exposed him to exposed him to a unknown alien mutagen, which caused him to gain some minor superpowers. All the ones I've listed, including the fact that he has to grow to use his power. 
That's amazing. Uh, at this point, he has decided that Earth needs guidance. Uh, he loves the people he's found here on Earth. At first, he didn't know what to expect. He landed in Africa and tried to obviously establish uh, communications and, and, and find a hiding place among the largest and definitely most intelligent land mammals to be found on this planet. Uh, after he realized that elephants here can't talk, he settled on humans. Uh, today, you'll find him hanging out in gambling casinos where he is a natural card shark, master of disguise, and a master of impersonating voices. He hides among the humans uh, in plain sight by simply acting as one of them. Uh, and uh, he has some friends, uh, whoever wants to go next. Welcome to Heroes Unlimited. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I rolled all that. Oh, and also he flies around in a tiny airplane. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Tiny Forgot about that part. Mm -hmm. He's a little tiny uh, Sopwith camel he flies around in. <laughs> yep. All right. Um, John, you're up next. All right. So I made Aaron Gonzalez. He is a journalist by trade, and uh, he goes all around the world doing stories. He speaks multiple languages. He's in amazing shape. He's great at both writing, photography, everything like that. He is a, a true man about the world. So unfortunately for him, that traveling around the world meant that he came into contact with a strange gem uh a gem that chose him and embedded itself into his very chest and so he rolled up that his background is a magic enchanted object and that object gives him magic powers that he can use so he has spells that he casts he's actually uh more of a wizard than your typical you know tights and capes type superhero uh, a lot of it is being able to affect the world around him and the senses of people he can turn invisible at will he can create bi blinding flashes see things that are invisible uh he can blind people or create charismatic auras around him uh as well he can make it so that he can heal wounds he can force people to speak the truth so he has a bunch of different magical powers that he can do now he normally resides in america his father is the mayor of uh i'm gonna go ahead and say san diego because that's where i am and your father is kevin falconer no it's oh. a different universe oh They're okay super I'm sorry yeah he, also, it's his like father is the falconer <laughs> no right 1987 uh i'm not going to try and remember who the, go the uh, governor of or mayor of san diego was uh, <laughs> it was the san diego chicken yeah obviously <laughs> famed padres dancing mascot <laughs> uh so he gets into uh a lot of tension with that because he's always breaking stories and trying to uncover dirt and of course his dad being the mayor wants to keep things very status quo and hush hush uh he's your standard decent looking fellow six foot 170 pounds and he's uh he's real protective of the young he he loves kids and he loves being able to make sure that everyone is doing things fair play and his superhero name is integrity i love that ryan do you want to tell us about your character yes um <laughs> so i came up with an actual true name for my character Ooh. felix bright mm. which uh if you take the first letter of his first name and an alternate word for bright you get Flux, his superhero name, F. Lux. Uh -huh. right. Okay. Ha -ha. <laughs> so, um, he is a mutant, um, and he was just born a normal human and came in contact with a very strange substance uh, when he was a early teen. And that transformed him not too much. I forget what he... Uh, what was his? Oh, he, he has scaly skin. Oh, yeah. Okay. I forgot about that part. Yeah, not too much. He's just got <laughs> reptile skin. <laughs> He's just got reptile skin. Or fish skin. And and uh, ironically enough, his only major super ability is chameleon, 
Uh, so he has the abilities of a chameleon, including walking up walls and changing the color of uh, uh, his skin. And, and looking in uh, two dif- different directions at the same time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Licking his own like eyeballs, that. you know. <laughs> <laughs> Normal chameleon stuff. <laughs> Normal stuff. But he actually grew up with a military background. His uh, family were military folks uh, moving around a lot. And uh, he actually went into the military as well um, uh, as a military specialist and uh, trained especially in the espionage skills. So uh, he's very sneaky, sneaky. And he likes to uh, hang out on ceilings and, and spy on stuff. That's one of his pastimes, just hanging out on the <laughs> one of his pastimes. <laughs> like hey, you do. same, um, you know. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I, I think we tied our origins together, Amelia. Uh, kind of, yeah. So we were exposed to the same sort of substance where my character's like natural mutations were unlocked because of it. Mm-hmm. And... Um, so that changed me into what I am, and I took my smarts... Because uh, I have an IQ of 25, uh, and went into computer programming, where I am now a computer programmer at the same facility that employs Amelia's character. Yes, I named my character Dahlia Edwardson. So she is affected by this same chemical from this medical facility, but we don't know really what the chemical is, and it was an accident. It's alien goop. Her ability now is to control plants, and all of her skills are based on hunting and tracking animals and identifying plants and fruits. Both plants and fruits. <laughs> plants and it's fruits, important. but not vegetables, just to be mm-hmm. clear. Um, <laughs> well, they also vegetables because they're plants. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's just those non-plant fruits yeah. you can identify. Um, but she can also fly and... Um, make fire and is impervious to fire so you know uh plants and fire but how does she fly uh wings leather wings apparently oh and also she has no hair at all (laughs) yep (laughs) because that has something to do with whatever happened is there Um, any plant that has a particularly leathery exterior that you could say that like maybe you fly on seaweed wings yeah like kelp Yes. I mean, someone's going to write in now that kelp's not a plant, and I know, I know, but it'd be cool, though, right? It would be cool. <laughs> okay. It would be cool. I, I mean, is kelp is just sea leather, right? It's basically sea leather. It's sea yeah. leather. It's um, not a plant, but whatever. At least you know it's not a plant, because you can identify plants. Well, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I, if yeah. it were a plant, I would know. Yeah. 40%. I can't control it, so it's not a plant. <laughs> yeah, obviously. Right. Just fly on wings of it. <laughs> And uh, my superhero name is Burning Bush, apparently. Apparently. <laughs> apparently. <laughs> that's what I wrote down uh, here on my sheet, so. Well, that's what it says. <laughs> Did you write down Burning Bush, apparently? Apparent. I should write that down. Burning okay, Bush, yeah, just apparently. Sure. <laughs> I like the idea of a superhero who is sort of standoffish about their superhero name. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's apparently. very modern. It's, it's a very Netflix yeah. superhero. <laughs> A brush fire, I guess. Yeah. Yes, that's yes, whatever. <sighs> the important part is that my character is principled and hot tempered, but overall pretty nice. They're a pretty nice person. Nice. Pretty nice. Yeah. All right. Well, let's go ahead and dive right into a segment we are calling D20 for your thoughts. D20 for your thoughts? In this segment, we want to talk to our guests about their thoughts on character creation and how it feels in this system compared to others. But first, we'd like to ask how each of you got into role-playing games in the first place. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) The abridged version. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sure. Well, uh, contrary to what most people on the internet who have heard of us probably think, we were not birthed from a single cabbage leaf or something. We actually didn't meet until we were in our 20s. Although our RPG origin story is the same. That is correct, yes. <laughs> we both started with Rifts was the very first game we ever played. And both in middle school. <laughs> nice. And of course, it wasn't enough for me to have Rifts be my first game. 
and all the ridiculousness that comes with a Palladium game, uh, I was a homebrew character as well. Mm-hmm. Oh, no. Yeah, a homebrewed <laughs> OCC, if I remember correctly, an electric version of the Burster. Indeed, I was a zapper. Yeah, which Why? eventually became wow. a real class. Why do you need to... There's so many books around. Well, I, when I started, those books weren't around. See, eventually, they released an electric version of the Burster. Yeah. It was even also called the Zapper. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Still my idea. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I, yeah, it might not have been the zapper. The it might have been the shocker. Uh, oh, the, the one you wrote. Yeah, yeah. That well, be, I didn't yeah. write it. I found it on a like a Wif, rifts web ring. Nice, you know, because this mm-hmm. was way back in the day. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh my goodness! How many rotating skulls were on that page? At least twelve. <laughs> yeah, well, the coalition. <laughs> yeah, uh, I I had a similar rifts upbringing, but I'll actually instead talk about my second role playing game, which was Dungeons and Dragons, uh, second edition. Uh, I played with a group, and the reason I want to tell the story is because I played with a group whose DM was one of those mega realistic type DMs, and so he routinely enforced a rule that ple- people don't know their own stats, and therefore we had to roll our stats uh, behind a sheet where he could see and we could not. And then he would tell us things like, you feel slightly more dexterous than the average person might be. What? It What's was it, it was an atrocious game uh, because that's the kind of thing that happened in the early 90s uh, when the excess uh, stat design of the late 80s was still in vogue. It was a terrible game. I do not. I played a wizard who died because he tried to break out of ropes he was tied up in by casting a large person on himself. And instead of it working, the DM adjudicated that it cut me into into concentric rings. Wow. Mm hmm. So, fun game. Uh, but otherwise, I had a great time playing Rips. you still played RPGs. <laughs> yeah, I had a lot of terrible <laughs> D&D DMs, but one particularly amazing Rifts DM, and so that's why I'm still where I am. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. How do you, people don't know their own stats? Like, what a weird... Like, I know things that I'm good at. Like, Yeah, but do you know if you're a 12 or a 13? I'm don't take t- Thomas' side. What I'm, I'm saying is, maybe you feel a little stronger than the average person, but you don't know the exact numbers. No one should take Tavis' side. No, no one should true. be named Tavis. <laughs> <laughs> that is a name that should be reserved for off-brand candies. <laughs> ah, Tavis brand huckleberry sucker. <laughs> Try new cinnamon Tavis. <laughs> we apologize to any listeners named <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Just You're kidding, just excited don't. that Change anyone knows that name. <laughs> uh. <laughs> oh gosh. So, so those are our two best stories. Yeah. Wow. That's. I mean. And you're still here. So. Oh gosh. Yep. Survived it. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh. Wow. How? <laughs> Why? Why are you well, still here? Like I mentioned, I had a really good Rifts DM at the time. I had a, yeah. I had a DM whose name I will also share because it was a good, decent name, Andy. People could just be named Andy. That's fine. <laughs> Andy's not a, Andy's not as bad as Tavis, um, who who had a good sense of fun and adventure and would totally let me play a robot Boba Fett. A Boba Fett. A Boba Fett, as, as it were. <laughs> Whereas my electricity zapper guy was from the vampire kingdoms of Mexico where... It was very unfortunate because vampires are weak against fire and running water. And of the three types of (laughs) kinetics you could be, there's pyro, hydro, and electro. And I was the one that couldn't affect vampires. Oh, it's the worst. It was the best. His entire backstory is his, his parents were so excited that he was psychic. And then he was useless. And then his family died and he moved to Canada. Did, Did his family die because he couldn't save them? Yes. So oh, he tragic. had a he had a dark past. Of course, it's the first RPG character I made. Yeah. But even then, he was just hilariously like matter of fact of things. In one of our adventures, like someone their girlfriend got like murdered by a serial killer, and they sent me to go like comfort them. And I was like, yeah. I'm sorry, she's been brutally murdered. <laughs> 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 what? What? <laughs> Uh, I also knocked myself unconscious with that wizard by running headlong into a waterfall, reasoning that there probably was stuff behind it. Because there's always stuff behind waterfalls in things like this. Yeah, like the the backside of water. Although that's just what my DM's interpretation was. I said, I checked to see if there's a cool secret space behind that waterfall. And he said, you run headlong into the waterfall and knock yourself unconscious. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) I'm about to knock you unconscious. They say, I'm I'm sorry, but I need a different DM. (laughs) I'm sorry, but Tavis, we will have words. 
<laughs> Change your name to Andy and come back. <laughs> yeah, come back to me. My second uh, yeah. D&D DM was named Steve, and his whole deal was everyone talk, talk like this. Everyone was like, what? What do you want? I'm an uh, eight-year-old girl. I'm uh. an eight-year-old girl. What, <laughs> kind, what, kind of, what kind of weapons do you want? Of course, this is Ravenloft. Ravenloft is all evil and dark. That's why there's also Sepultura music on kind of low. Wow. Yeah, I DM with a gas mask a on. Day. Everyone DMs with a gas mask on. <laughs> uh, anyway, that's our backstories. <laughs> that's amazing. Can you guys tell us about your process for making characters like in any role playing game? Not necessarily this one, but in general, like what kind of process do you use when you sit down to make a character? I think John would probably be best here at describing my method of making characters. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Finding what the most broken possible thing is and then slapping on a thin veneer of wackiness. Yeah, no, I'm John. (laughs) And my favorite thing to do is to find out if there's a luck thing you can get in the game and then get it immediately. And then everything else I roll randomly. Oh, that's true. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm doing a dumb voice, <laughs> but I am being 100% accurate. <laughs> also, this is what you sound like. Blah. Yeah, this is what you sound like. This is why we can't do each other's voices. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, for real, for real answers. For real, John, go ahead. Uh, so most of the time, I usually work from mechanics outward. Uh, I usually don't go in knowing like, oh, I want to play someone that's like this and they'll have powers that are like whatever. I'll usually start with one kernel of an idea uh, mechanically. So whether that's like a power in a superhero game or uh, like a class for D&D, something that I want to play with. And then as I layer on things to it, I sort of use justifications for why that exists. So like making a warlock in D&D and saying like, oh, I have a pact with the Fae. Okay, why do I have a pact with the Fae? And then extrapolating from there. I like to build... It's true that I have an eye for finding ways to break games, and I will often abuse that for fun, but just for fun. Uh, It's not like when anyone anyone catches me making a character who does infinite damage or whatever, and they they point it out, it's not like I don't just change the character right away. I'm not not married to it. I just like seeing things break in systems. Um, (laughs) But when it comes to actually designing characters, I make characters based on hooks. Uh, I, I don't want my character to be impervious to what the DM is trying to run. I want them to be as accessible as possible for storytelling purposes so all of my characters are as hooky as i can make them they have uh they have families they have backstories they have uh, relations with the other or relationships with the other i mean sometimes they have, oh, they have relations sometimes with the other characters. <laughs> they get a lot of maritals um but I, I like them to have built uh deep relationships existing with the other characters with npcs in the world uh because i find nothing more, more boring than a game where the dm is just kind of setting a scene that has nothing to do with the party i, I like mm-hmm. that I like being immersed or, or connected to the world that I'm immersed in. So I try yeah. my, my number one goal when I'm building a character nowadays is hooks. Yeah, there's nothing worse than when you build an entire setting and you're like, all right, guys, here's the world we're playing. in." And someone's like, I have no family. I have no friends. I'm a lone wolf. I don't care about anything. And I don't know anyone. I'm isolationist yeah. death murder. Yeah, that's never that's <laughs> never like, cool. Oh, good. Well, I suppose I'll get you into this game by. Was it my turn? I don't care what happens on anyone else's turn, and Why that's did you that's even show up here to this yeah. collaborative game. Yeah, that's the opposite I of what to I like. Win. I, my characters are all I, I like. If I'm talking fourth edition D and I, I stray towards leaders because uh, I, I like my turns to to involve other players so I can keep people involved in the game and the conversation. That's cool. Yeah. So um, about Heroes Unlimited, how do we think? The character creation for this game stacks up to other systems that we've played. Uh, well, <laughs> I mean, it's... How loaded of a question is It that? was designed in 18, 1984, and it shows. Yeah. Yeah, they've... I mean, Palladium just very famously doesn't change things. Like, they might update a few things or add stuff, mm-hmm. but they very rarely go back and refine what is there. They kind so, of dug themselves into a hole, though, I think. Yo, very Riff. much so. Although we interviewed Simbito once, and he mentioned that he is working on Rifts too. But I bet you he's been working on it for twenty five years. Oh yeah, I'll bet. Mm-hmm. The, I mean the the thing is for especially for us, we've played so much Rifts, so much Heroes Unlimited, and all of this before that it's all of the tricks to making a character of like 
okay, what skills do you use to start with? What do you use for your secondaries? Uh, what should a character look like? When do I roll certain things? What can I skip? What can't I? Is just sort of ingrained in us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it is, I mean, we had one person on this podcast who does not normally make Palladium characters, and uh, her a- anguish was like... <laughs> not to um, name names. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Helpful. <laughs> Let's just Very let's just call her A so. Antrim. You know what? Yeah. That's that's too obvious. Let's just call her Amelia A. Yeah. Shmashmelia. Shmashmelia. It rhymes with Shmashmelia. Shmantrum. Jonathan, but the the uh, the anguish was palpable, uh, it, and, yeah. and it, it's definitely a game that it, you need to get hooked on when you're like thirteen. It's hard. There, yeah. There's so much math and so much like. Uh, just options. I mean, we didn't even get into how the combat system works. Not even close. Yeah. The (laughs) real problem, uh, especially when you're dealing with a game like Heroes Unlimited, is I would say probably a good 80% of making a character revolves around skills Mm -hmm. and almost none of it matters. Yeah. You feel like it does when you're, when you're making the character, you're like, Oh, this is going to inform so much about my character. And then when exposed to play, no, it it almost never does. Are you telling me that my fishing skill is not going to come up? I mean, it might. (laughs) Yeah. You never know. It really depends on the GM. I would imagine at that point. I mean, I know my backflip skill came up a lot. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> but it, it's interesting because uh, once we get to the advancement segment, well, we'll talk a little more about this. But like, your skills give you quick experience, uh, and if you can do something, especially something useful, then you you get a little bit of experience because of that. Yeah, it the character creation process of the system is it's complex, but it has so many different options that it makes it kind of a min-maxer's playground. Yeah. I mean, if you don't do what we sort of did, which is randomly roll for everything, yeah. then you can very easily make some ridiculously powerful characters. Mm-hmm. Uh, that said, and, no one's impressed. And the thing is, even with <laughs> random generation, the... The weird thing for Heroes Unlimited with me is that the complexity scales so much. Yeah. Because you can have, from the low end, say, the character I had with a enchanted object. I roll one thing. I might have had a superpower, mm-hmm. and that's it. And then I don't mm-hmm. write anything else down. Yeah. All the way up to when you're making, say your own personal robot and you have to budget and spend money for each individual item and like your legs and your arms and everything else. Different levels of AI hours to do. Yeah. Uh, Like uh, my alien character, for example, I had to roll like seven random rolls to determine what kind of alien from what kind of planet and what's their Mm -hmm. education and how much they like earth. And then I finally came to a roll, which was what are your superpowers? I know, what kind of powers do you have? And I rolled, and I got experiment, which meant that in addition to being an alien, I also have to go roll everything that's in the experiment category. Yeah. It can take a long time to do that. Uh, here's, It's a clunky system that's kind of old, and its weight definitely shows. Uh, it may not be fun for beginners, and it definitely feels a little outdated. However, uh, the results it generates are so weird that that alone generates enough fun factor to keep this game relevant to me. Yeah, and I think it's really unique that there are all those random tables that you can literally, aside from some skill selections where they actually tell you you have to select skills now, you can do completely random characters, basically. Oh, yeah. And I, that is one of the things I absolutely love, especially for superhero games, is getting a random collection of powers or themes and finding something to tie them together finding some way to make them make sense yeah right uh, to me i don't really like random generation especially when it comes to character design i have a soft spot for old palladium games uh and superheroes and even then my favorite the only thing i really like to randomly roll is superpowers because it gives me a random pick that I can kind of pull a character name out of, you know? Mm -hmm. It's a lot of fun to roll three random superpowers and go, oh, gosh, what do these add up to? And then get something. So what I often tell people, like, when they complain to to, uh, me nowadays, 
in my capacity as a show host from time to time uh, about like masks and, and, and newer superhero games where superpowers barely matter. So you don't even really get to roll them is use these old systems. Use uh, use Heroes Unlimited, use uh, Marvel Super Heroes role-playing, and only use them for power generation. Just roll that part randomly, and it'll give you something completely insane, and you can try and generate your character from that. Yeah, it gives you a springboard to yep. uh, really go, oh, okay, now I've got an idea. It throws you the energy ball. You just need a suggestion from the audience. Mm-hmm. I do like the random power generation as well, because it's so tempting if you pick powers to just do... Uh, I have invulnerability and yeah. flight have, and energy expulsion. I have, uh, you yeah. know, supernatural strength so mm-hmm. I can punch things real hard. Like picking your very generic level superhero stuff is so tempting that the fact that you end up getting things you're like, okay, well, now I have clock manipulation and <laughs> underwater powers. Mm-hmm. So I guess I'm water clock. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good name one See, of my favorite- that's what I love yeah. is picking random stuff and then deciding what's my superhero one of my favorite things I ever rolled in this game was a guy I named him Tsunami and he had sonic speed the major super ability which gives him a, a ground speed of a little over Mach 1 right he can run like yep. 800 miles an hour uh, and I also had underwater abilities which says you can swim at three times your speed Oh, it no. It, it doesn't say three times your base speed it just says three times your speed so I was like okay well my guy can swim at Mach 3 <laughs> <laughs> so so I named him Tsunami and his whole deal was just that he traveled fast enough to create waves. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh and it's interesting as I was looking through some of the the stuff in in the book you, there's uh even descriptions on combining different superpowers and what sort of results that would be. Oh yeah. And if you have ultra physical structure water and uh sonic speed you can ch- change yourself into a water behemoth that can run Mach 1 and create massive water tsunamis that can completely devastate your opponents. Yeah, absolutely. It's just, it's just wild the amount of different combinations you can have in this game. I think the thing I like about random random rolling, too, is that, like, you know, Ryan, you had Mutant and I had Experiment, which, like, is how that would end up. Like, you don't get to pick those powers and you're going to end up with something weird if you're like a failed medical experiment mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. yeah exactly like, it makes sense to have a plant control <laughs> like, <laughs> yep sure does we've talked a little bit about it already but how do you think that the mechanics of character creation reinf- reinforce the feel of this game <laughs> <laughs> complex um, well, here's the thing. Once you actually start playing this game, you realize that the combat system is also pretty out of date. It, it feels very uh, whose line, line is it anyway in, in the sense that it's all made up and the points don't matter. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I guess it's it reinforces it in, in certain ways. Part of it is that it takes forever to make a character in this game. And the characters are super front loaded. Barring some occasional very rare roles, you don't really change on leveling up. Uh, Ryan, your character was going to change dramatically on leveling up because he made an mm-hmm. extremely rare role in, in his mutant power table. But, for example, uh, my character, uh, if he gained a level, would gain 1d6 hit points and he'd have to write down plus 4 or 5% on like 35 different skills. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that was all he was going to do until level 15, which is the cap in this game. Uh, so it, it, the fact that your character is front-loaded and as powerful as they really are going to get out of the gate lends you a sense of of uh, kind of stability it feels like i mean because it's a game where leveling doesn't matter Mm -hmm. it ends up having this distinct focus more on what you're doing than what you will be doing that's true Mm -hmm. you're powerful out of the gate that's that's a nice thing to think about Compared to a lot of other role playing games where they have that kind of earn your fun mentality that's Well yeah, when you're a dirt farmer and mm-hmm. they're like, Well, you're gonna need to get six levels before you can do anything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I've even seen superhero games that work that way, where you have to start out as a crud superhero and earn your fun. Uh Aberrant D twenty felt like that. But this is a game where no, you come out the gate and you are already Spider Man or whatever. Whatever whatever superhero you manage to roll, you're you're that. You don't have to you don't have to earn it. You're not level one really. You're you're a superhero. Well, unless you're uh, my character who yes. has the the weird altering f- superpower thing. Although that is extraordinarily rare. There's like it is. It two really results is. in any table in the game that does that. And it's it, one of the things that was added in second edition of Heroes Unlimited. Mm-hmm. Uh, that table was only really modified to, to add those weird results to it. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, I remember that wasn't in the, the first edition. Yep. I think magic is one of the few things that does have that because it'll have things like 
duration will be based on level or damage will be based on level. But mm -hmm. even then, my character has, with a magic object, everything is sixth level for him and it doesn't change. Yeah. So at first level, he's casting at sixth level. At 15th level, he's casting at sixth level. It doesn't matter. Yeah. 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 And more than that, the fact that you can cast any spell you want. Uh, this game has 15 levels of spells and 15 levels of character progression, but a first level character can cast a 15th level spell. No, assuming you roll the ability to do that. Yeah, if you have the spell. If you're taught the spell, you can cast it. It doesn't. It's not yep. fancy, and you don't earn your, your levels of spells. So why are they broken into levels, then? Because D&D broke it into levels. <laughs> Mostly it's how much it costs to cast. Yeah. Higher level spells cost more, Yeah, and gotcha. that's about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Why not? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it feels like there's just, like, a lot of, like, tacking on ones and twos and, like... It just, I don't know, it feels like a lot to keep track of. Well, you can see this in the progression of, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to system mastery out again here for a second. You, you can see this in the progression over the decades of role-playing game design that in the, this game was designed super early. Like 1984 is basically the caveman era of role-playing game design. And yeah. a lot of people who were designing role-playing games back then did things because that's what D&D &D does. Yeah. Uh, they had yeah. levels, they had levels of spells, they had humans and elves, because that's what D&D &D does. I mean, it's even worse in the 70s. All the games that aren't D&D &D in the 70s might as well be. Like, if, I don't know if you've ever seen the original Bunnies and Burrows. It's just D&D, mm -hmm. &D, but bunnies. <laughs> <laughs> that's a thing that's been fascinating over the course of doing this show, too, is just seeing, like, what weird design things we've carried forward into modern game design and mm -hmm. what things we've been like, nope, stay over there. Yeah. There was, I'm trying to remember what it was, but there was something even in Traveler that we talked about that it was like, oh, this is a thing that we've brought forward into modern game design. And it seems like there are not many things from this game that we have pulled forward. <laughs> but there are things it pulls forward. Uh, yeah. no, like the word level being used for a variety of things when it would be much simpler to have a different synonym for it. It's yeah. always been weird that a 15th level wizard can cast an, an 8th level spell. And it's like, why aren't those, why are those both called level? That's confusing. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's because D&D &D did that. Other words yet. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. All right. So how does the process of character creation then set a player's expectations for playing this system? Well, let's ask the person who did this for the first time ever. What do you think? <laughs> um, well, I mean, my expectation is that it's going to be a lot of math and that, like, you would have to roll for everything. <laughs> yes. That, that's pretty yes, accurate. <laughs> yeah, I that's mean, pretty like, accurate. Roll to, like, knock on the door. Like, that feels like this kind of game. Here's a big distinguishing thing between this and Dungeons and & Dragons. And, and in, in the 80s, this was a huge change. This was a, a big break away from how D&D did things. You roll for defense. So well, instead of just rolling yeah. to hit AC, you roll, and then the other person rolls dodge or parry. Mm -hmm. Which just doubles the number of rolls you have to deal with right off, yep. right, right away. Yeah, active defense is one of my favorite things about this system, in, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Um, because in D and D, it always frustrated me coming from a Palladium background. Uh, the attacker is the only one that rolls, and you just passively defend. Whereas here, you get to choose how you defend, and it, it feels a little bit more cinematic. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely true. Uh, I mean, granted, it also has the D and D system because of AR. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's kind of a mishmash, but it does it. It's interesting in that you get a sense of of feeling like you're. Con you're controlling during defense like yeah. you have something to do yeah even if it, you just roll another d20 yeah i do i do like it uh, you get to choose how you defend um and if you get the automatic dodge like we talked about before you get to uh do cooler things i guess one thing that becomes apparent in palladium games is that the numbers get too big for their britches really fast yeah if you play this game long enough you'll learn how to stack strike parry and dodge bonuses to the point where you're rolling a d20 and then adding 19 to it Mm -hmm. and uh, it feels silly because you only need like a 17 to hit. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm already adding nine to my dodge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, when I was a kid, the way we fixed that problem, and this is a stupid way to fix it, so please no one, <laughs> no one, no one walk away with this and try and use it, is we just moved to a D30 instead of a D20. Oh, no. Yeah, it didn't help. It didn't make a difference. Yeah, that's it was, not it, doing anything it, for yeah, you. It did not, <laughs> but we, we sure thought it did because we were 13. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a complex game. There's a lot of house rules that fix a lot of problems with the game. That is true. And, I mean, that's... I hate saying that, like, oh, well, house rules fix it, because you can't say that a system is good if you have to change it in order to make it work. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. honestly, I don't think I've ever played any game where someone didn't say, oh, and when we're playing, we do meh. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. important to, to evaluate whether house rules can fix a game or not through the lens of, but how much do you need to do it and how much have you gotten used to it? Mm-hmm. Like, there's nothing worse than arguing with someone about whether or not an old role-playing game is good. And they're like, it was amazing because we changed everything. Right. And it's like, right. okay, then it, then how was it amazing? Yeah. <laughs> well, you see, I was my 12 at the time. experience with yeah. it was amazing, but the game mm-hmm. itself is. Yeah. And you can have an, you can have an absolutely stellar experience playing these old Palladium games because they are very good, uh, imagination boosters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I feel that way a lot of, about a lot of role playing games. Though. Like, I feel that way about Shadowrun too. That is a garbage game. Oh yeah. But oh, I had fun trash. playing it. Yeah. Like. My experience with it was awesome. It's mm-hmm. not a good game. <laughs> no. And that's, I mean, that's the sad thing for things like Shadowrun or Rifts or Heroes Unlimited or things like that is they have such a amazing core of imagination to them yeah. that you're like, I want to play with this. I want to take this weird, dumb setting you've made and just run through it with my arms backward like I'm Naruto. Yeah. (laughs) Thankfully, you know, it's not that hard to just take a game and play it in another engine. Oh, no. But it's It's, when you look at it and you go, yeah, but now I can't play this in what it is supposed to be. It's weirdly hard to convince your friends to do it. If you're like, guys, I'd love to play Shadowrun, but Shadowrun is trash. So what I would really like to do is play, you know, Savage Worlds or something simple and Mm -hmm. we'll just reskin everything so it's got Shadowrun names. And they're like, yeah, "Mm." But then right. I can't then I can't play Shadow Run. <laughs> right. Right. Well, and there's something to be said about like, is that system serving the purpose that it was designed for then? I like I I always go back to L5R because that is like my game of choice. But Yeah, your guilty at, pleasure, at, I gotcha. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. But there are things about that game that people are like, well, I just want to pl- like I want to play in that world, but I'd rather play it in like a D20 system. And well, I'm heck, like, that's well, easy. no, because there are certain things that are built into the mechanics of that game mm-hmm. to reinforce the feel of that. Can I tell you system. a deep personal secret? My mm-hmm. first experience with L5R was through D20 because it was completely stolen and republished as the 3.5 X D&D Oriental Adventures Guide. Mm hmm. Yep. And that was the first time I ever saw it. Uh, I I had never played the actual game before that. And I bought the 08 book and I was like, why is this book completely full of boring samurai? Because they didn't present them especially well. So it was like, you can play as nine different kinds of boring samurai or nine other different kinds of boring samurai wizard. Or you can be (laughs) a cool monkey dude. And and, uh, when I finally saw that L5R was its own game line and read it, I was like, oh, okay. This is terrible as Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> this is yeah, because yeah, it doesn't do what it's meant to do. I mean, and honestly, like now having played the new edition of it, the fifth edition, I'm like, oh, these mechanics actually like are what this game has been trying to do this whole time. Mm-hmm. But I, I mean, there's something to be said for like you can reskin lots of games and you can play, you know, this world in a different system. But mm-hmm. like ideally, your mechanics for your game should further (laughs) this the setting and the story that you want to tell too you're absolutely right well i think i mean in terms of like shadow run or rifts or heroes unlimited i think the fact that it's garbage adds to what you're playing because Mm -hmm. the world (laughs) you're in is stupid and your rules are (laughs) stupid and everything's just reinforcing this idea of (laughs) you are in a setting that you shouldn't be taking seriously. I mean, yeah. the nice thing about Shadowrun right. is that since Shadowrun represents the far future of the 80s, you know what I mean? Like it's <laughs> mm-hmm. it's it, mm-hmm. the the, uh, the idea that you should be playing with an 80s rule set feels right. And, oh, you know, totally. Which is why first edition Shadowrun is why what everyone should be playing, because that is an 80s rule set. But, uh, but you know, it is it is kind of neat to play an old garbage system to represent a thing that was invented in an old garbage time. Right. I mean, and I think that, you know, you think about comic books and stuff and there's so much garbage in them like i mean the longer they go on the more you're like what happened what what is going on now Mm -hmm. and so like that feels correct for a game about superheroes that like you're in the third or fourth iteration of this series and Mm -hmm. things have gone way off the rails but we're still here yeah yeah so anyway the the end result is that this game does some things that strongly support its mechanics uh, or, or the feel of play in it, mostly in the in the terms of like random rolling and the fact that the powers do crazy amounts of damage because why wouldn't they? It's a superhero universe. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in terms of being f- uh, high-end functional, I would, I don't know, like a 
B minus, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if I was going to rate this on the fruit scale from F to S, yeah, that's, what, what kind of fruit would this be? <laughs> this game is not a pineapple. <laughs> this no. game is no pineapple. Is it? A, sir. Is it a grape? <laughs> yeah, uh. grape solid uh, B tier. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, we've talked about a lot of flaws, but if you had to pick one, what is the biggest flaw? <laughs> Ooh, yeah. The biggest flaw in Heroes of, or of in, uh, the Universe. Okay. Well, yeah, of the character creation process. For me, in particular. the biggest flaw in character creation, and this is endemic to all things Palladium, is they have a no idea what balance is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> because you random roll for so many things, and because... So much is split between so many different ideas of characters. Mm -hmm. You can have a party that consists of basically a stage magician and Superman. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) And unlike in the comic books where, you know, the writer of it can be like, oh, yeah, you know, Batman always has something to do. And we wrote Batman to be super smart and super whatever, whereas... If I'm a stage magician and I rolled poorly for my stats anyway, I'm just kind of like, I, I, I made a rabbit appear. Yeah. I hope that stopped that villain. And meanwhile, you know, Superman is over there blasting him with eye beams going mm-hmm. like, good job. Yeah, but don't you understand, John? That's a chance for you to have a role playing challenge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the lack of balance in anything. I mean, even just within the powers themselves, you look at something like... Uh, alter physical structure stone and alter physical structure metal and alter physical structure metal is just a better version Mm -hmm. it has more sdc it has better strength it's just a better power coming down Mm -hmm. pro colossus over the thing which i'm pretty sure is the opposite of the truth in the marvel universe yeah and it's it's just a a point where you look at it and go if I'm picking powers, like if I take the random chance out of this game, yeah, then this can get wildly uh, out of balance. Mm-hmm. Oh, Very easily, fast. yeah, yeah. I mean, this seems like a min maxer's dream, though. It is. Like, yeah. The problem, the problem with this is, it could be a min maxer's dream if you were not looking to impress people. Because if you were like, I made my character without rolling randomly, and my character is basically invincible, they'd be like, big deal. There's a book. There's a power in the book called invulnerability. You didn't. Yeah. You, you didn't have to work that hard to be this smart. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This wasn't like, ooh, I discovered one weird trick. DMs yeah. hate me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You you, you it, took the you took the easy road. <laughs> it is interesting uh, from a min maxer perspective because I've I've done this quite a few times with this system because uh, I had to make so many characters. Because um, <laughs> you kept dying. Because I kept dying. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, it didn't work. Is I focused on like one particular trait, uh, maybe like auto dodge or attacks per melee or something like that, and figured out, tried to figure out how I could best optimize that between the superpowers that were available to me. Yeah, you want that multiple arms. Oh, Gives yeah. You so many attacks per melee round. Uh, See, I always wanted to have weird combinations. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. so like. Uh, copy superpower and then create clones of yourself mm, yeah. and the clones of yourself don't come with the ability to make clones but they do come with any other superpowers you have yep. so then they copy your ability to make clones and then make clones yeah yep <laughs> yeah. or sh- what was it shrinking and expansion or uh, the uh, the one where you fly up inside of someone's head and then explode oh yeah uh yep. <laughs> shrinking and sonic flight yeah and you just fly into someone's face and then explode them yeah yep. um there's there's all these power tricks you can do that are you know goofy combinations. Yeah. If I had to pick a specific weakness, uh, like one thing that I think needs to be fixed in this book, uh, I would say it's the the roll three d six down the line assigned yes. as directed. Ugh. I mean, it, it, am I hearing Betty Davis eyes? Because that's 1981. I mean, that is that's so old that it that it, it's got a dinosaur running around near it. It, it, it only yeah. happened in one edition of D anD D, and it wasn't even the first edition. It was the second, and even yeah. then, it was it, still. An option. No, that not was the, the that, only thing. No, it wasn't the only thing. It was the default in in second edition D anD D. In first edition, it was version four. Don't use this. Yeah, like there was a letter from Gary Gygax in a Dragon magazine where he was like, "Do not roll three d six down the line. It's stupid. If you're gonna make a dumb yeah. character that's bad. Please don't." Yeah. 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 Well, especially back then when all of the different classes that you could choose from were 
required certain attributes to be oh, certain yeah. levels. Yeah, I forget if it's four or five zeros before you start seeing any other number in the chance to randomly roll a bard on 3d6 no, uh, or, or uh, straight down the line. It's like point zero 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 three six or something like that. Yeah, it's ridiculous. That's crazy. I don't want to play games where you can't be what you want to be. Like, why are you? The mindset yeah. in that era was that you earned it, that it was that if you rolled a paladin randomly, you were earning that fun. Yeah. Well, yeah, that was a thing that you got to be able to say. Is, mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, I'm playing a paladin, not because I wanted mm-hmm. to, but because I was lucky enough to. Mm-hmm. Well, at the very least, in, in Heroes Unlimited, it doesn't limit what you can be. No. It just yeah. limits how good you are at being that. Yeah. Um, and in very, uh, like, the physical strength is one of the only hugely limiting ones, and maybe speed. Uh, for tactical stuff, you, you can't lift as much if your PS is three. Yep, that's true. So, so that's very limiting. And speed, if your speed's three, you're you're just going to be like slowly moving around. But mm-hmm. if you have superpowers, that can easily make up for almost all of it, especially if you can choose. I mean, to put it uh, to break it down even further, this game probably has twice as many statistics as it needs to. Yeah, and, and they're not granular enough. Like mm-hmm. if every number on a 3d6 roll below 16 doesn't do anything, then that system needs to be reworked. Yeah. Yeah. How balanced are the different character types? We talked a little bit about this. <laughs> um, and we I would imagine that some are significantly better than others. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I've done the math before, oddly enough, on chances for certain amounts of powers mm-hmm. and uh, the power levels as far as major and minor. And you can see things like experiment is better than mutant. Yes. Yeah, straight flat out. Yeah. Having, especially within certain things, like you look at uh, the magic system, being an enchanted item is straight up worse than the other three options you could get. Yeah. yeah. Especially magic weapon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, magic weapon is basically magic item, but it does more for you. Exactly. It's compared yeah. to, it's, it's like, why is magic item even there? Because we wanted more choices. Yep. It's yeah. true. It's because it's thematically, well, because yep. it gives uh, you magical that not from an, yeah. a weapon. Well, it's because of certain superheroes who carry around an item, like the Green Lantern or Vixen. Or uh, even Dr. Fate. Yeah. yeah. The so why, don't, why wouldn't you just make weapon like a choice under magic item? Like, why wouldn't you just like make that a sub option i mean like. th- here's the kind of thing where he thought that the four distinct categories would be fun to roll on and then design out individually and then when he realized that uh that they two of the categories were basically identical and should have been merged together he had already put that in his glue machine layout thing and so there you go okay mm-hmm. <laughs> too late it's gone to print mm-hmm. you look at something like uh let's take the robotics or cybernetics. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, even if you roll really well and get a very high budget and you yeah. build a robot for a specific purpose, let's say I'm making PunchBot. Mm-hmm. PunchBot, I'm going to crank that strength up as high as it can go. I'm going to crank its armor up. I'm going to really get all of this as high to the height that you can possibly get this. And a guy with supernatural PS is going to beat you every time. Yes. Yep. And in like a punch or two. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's staggering how the, it feels like each one of the, the categories in this game was, was developed by people who were not talking to each other, mm-hmm. which is weird because they're all pretty much written by the same guy. Um, but, <laughs> but not at the same time uh, is, is the thing. Uh, yeah. When he adds new stuff to this game, he does not go back and check what it does to the other stuff mm-hmm. in the game. I guarantee balance was not on the minds of no. uh, anybody that was designing on this game. Not even a little bit. Uh, so no. basically, when it comes down to what's the balance like in this game, there isn't any. No. No. And Jeff sort of joked about it earlier. Their response to that is, well, that's just role playing time. Yeah, it's challenge. If, if your character you're, sucks. If you're playing with a guy who's physical training and what are you? Oh, I'm a I'm basically like Mr. Terrific or something. And yeah. I've, I'm just running around and I'm I'm cool and I'm boxing and I'm an Olympic athlete. And then someone else says. I shoot uh, fire out of my body and M fire and fly. Mm-hmm. You're like, oh, cool. Well, we can definitely tackle the same problems. Yes. Right. It, it's a, I mean, it's realistic to comic books. I mean, those two characters exist in the same universe. Yeah, You've but usually they Mr. aren't on the same team. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Terrific yes, and but Fire can are. one of them do yeah. ventriloquism? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, well, it, I mean, 
this is it, it, it leads to a common misconception in role playing game design, which is that if your character is bad, that's so that you can be good at role playing. Uh, this is this is a bizarre misconception that's that's lasted in role playing for forever. You can be good at role playing with any character. Mm-hmm. Oh, if you have a bad stat, that means it's time for you to be good at role playing. Yeah, or you could be good at role playing with a good character who has good stats. There's no difference in terms of your capacity to go in there and have a good time. It, it's just. It, it's a weird thing that people basically game designers started putting that as a little block at the front of their book so that they wouldn't have to balance their book. Right. They were just like, uh, yeah, it is definitely possible to make one character who is ludicrously better than another one to the point where the, the person with a bad character won't be having any fun. But mm-hmm. uh, role playing. Think about it as a learning opportunity. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the things I love about the Palladium systems is uh, not not so much the lack of balance, but more of a. Uh, they go for a, a feel of the different types of characters that you can create. And they mainly want you to be able to create these cool sounding characters yeah. from from the comic books. And you can easily do that in a lot of cases, which is remarkable. Uh, but yeah, it it's very hard to have a party of people in a game designed around combat more or less and have one person or two people not be even remotely combat worthy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the ways I got around it in a game that I ran was everyone randomly rolled characters. And of course everyone had just dumb garbage. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then the whole conceit was they got, abducted by aliens, experimented on, and then all of their powers became good. So essentially it was roll a random thing, now go back, take what you randomly rolled, and if you could make this into a good character, how would you do it with purpose? Hmm. So it was essentially doing the whole use this as a springboard, your random rolls, but now go back and make someone that isn't terrible. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I've always played this game when I run it. It's comedy, so the disparity of power level isn't as important, or it becomes part of the comedy. Mm-hmm. Like, my favorite game I ever ran of this, I uh, I gave everyone about a half hour to roll random characters, completely random rolls, but the rule was, whatever they randomly rolled, they had to twist it into a uh, kind of super patriotic American archetype thing because they were going to be on they were going to be on a super American team uh, and then they were going to fight evil Canadian celebrities. Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> And uh, and so it you know we ended up with an amazing team. It was like uh, Hawaiian Punch, the ancient master from Hawaii, uh, <laughs> rolling because because you can tell what year I did this because it was rolling blackout. The guy who was who was uh, built by when California was experiencing massive power outages over and over again. Oh, no. mm-hmm. He was based on that. Uh, we had Stealth Bombshell, who was a woman with a magic sword who could turn her invisible, but even when she was invisible, she could fly at supersonic speeds, trailing an American flag cloud behind her. Oh wow. And one more whose name escapes me. Um, but anyway, the the uh, the party was, you know, fighting Canadian celebrities. And it didn't matter that one of them was just a guy who could throw good punches, uh, the Hawaiian punch character, because it was funny. It was all just fun. So that that actually did work really well. Yeah. I mean, I feel like Ryan has a point that I mean, there's there's a lot of options to, like, make really cool combinations of things. I think the problem comes in the numbers that are attached to those things. Yeah, yeah, that's that, true. Like, and that's... It's just the 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 disparity is in the numbers, not in, like, the flavor of those choices. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I know that it's not super fun to say, take a game and use a different game to play it. But this is a great example of a game where that's a good idea. Mm-hmm. Like, roll up your character strip all the numbers off him, and then go play him in masks or some, some other superhero game. And you'll, you'll probably have just as good, if not better, of a time. Oh, I just remember my fourth super American character. He was, uh, he was an angel named the, the, uh, the Mo- Moral Majority. Oh. He, was, he, was like a Southern ba- he was like a Southern Baptist angel preacher who could fire l- lightning bolts from his eyes. Oh, my That's goodness. That's so good. Yeah, that game was amazing. That's so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> I think that we maybe touched on this a little bit earlier, and it sounds horrible um (laughs) how does creating npcs differ from creating player characters in this game it does not does not (laughs) yep there it is yep uh i mean shut it down mostly you can skip the skill packages and that's about it Mm -hmm. i mean usually when you're making a villain you're like all right what powers do they have and what's their like 
SDC. Yeah, that's all you really need to know. Attack like, if, if, if they pull out clubs and one of the players is like, well, do those guys have WP club? You're then like, yes, they do. Shut up. You're like, man, you're not a good player. Um, <laughs> get out of here. You, you can't go to Taco Bell with Thomas, us. Thomas, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Who invited you? <laughs> so, but yeah, that's always been a weakness of the Palladium system is that they they put so much effort into the bells and whistles of fun things to play as and so little effort into the things you would have to go out into the woods and fight. Mm-hmm. And even then, in a lot of their books, when you find a like a bestiary it's still like oh what are their stats instead of telling you what they are it says well they'll normally have 4d6 plus 8 you're like just give me a stat block i don't need to randomly roll 15 different giant beetles yeah that's that's (laughs) like you encounter the mindalar the giant mind slug there's one of them in every dimension Uh oh it's got it's got 2d6 plus 2 physical beauty what why would i roll that there's only one (laughs) yeah yeah And the variance is so much that you look at it and you go like, oh, here's a creature. It has 1d4 times 1,000 damage capacity. And you're like, okay, that's a lot of difference mm-hmm. between 1,000 and 4,000. Yeah, but think yeah. of how few dice you have to roll. <laughs> no, <right. laughs> uh, well, and then like how, I mean, as a player, like you have no clue what you're going up against ever then. Like, oh, no. No, no, not at all. Never. <laughs> okay, cool. All right. You just sort of go, hey, uh, I'm going to shoot a beam at that guy. Is that yep. cool? And your DM goes, yeah, it's radical. I mean, it depends on what game you're playing. In this game, you could probably one shot a lot of your enemies if you have some of the bigger name superpowers. Yeah. In Rifts, Rifts is basically a pillow fight. <laughs> Everyone has hundreds of MDC and they do tens of MDC in damage. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you spend a, you, most of your turns are just I ineffectually flail at the monster. The monster responds by ineffectually yeah. flailing right back at you. <laughs> Ironically, you can create heroes and limited characters in rifts, mm-hmm. and they are, uh, depending on the super abilities or the character type, uh, completely underpowered. Yeah, uh, they compared very to much are. most of rifts. Yeah, or very overpowered. Like or very John overpowered. T- yeah, John was telling his story about playing in the Vampire Kingdoms game, and when I did that in my own session, I made a superhero whose ability was alter physical structure water. I was oh, like, yeah. what's up, Van- what's up, vampires? I am running water. <laughs> yeah. I'm running at you. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, awesome. you can make you can make super OP characters too. Yeah. Let's talk about this group's cohesion. Uh how does our group kind of gel mechanically with the system? How would we fare in a typical session in this game? You well, know- we have a I mean there's not really a way to, like, you don't use a map for rifts, really. No. Yeah. And there's a lot of theater of the mind, but when you look at it, we do have a big frontline person. Mm-hmm. Even though my power is hiding. Sure. Well, <laughs> yeah, but you get up in front, and then you put them in total darkness, and they're mm-hmm. like, I don't know what's going on. That's true. <laughs> I'm actually a little disappointed in my character because he's not a good team player. S- surrounding the, the whole room in pitch darkness is not a great idea unless everyone else can see in it, too. Mm-hmm. But then we've got sort of a ranged damage dealer with the fire and also some control with plants. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you can get, like, vines to tangle people up and whatnot. Mm-hmm. We've got uh, my sort of support character. I've got a lot of ways to... Uh, mess with bad guys mm-hmm. and help out the heroes. Yep. Uh, and then we've got uh, your character. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I feel like you can do like the close combat kind of stuff, like the sneaking up and getting behind them. And mm-hmm. not, not really. No. Um, no I I'm, would say more. It's the infiltration. Like I, the, I'm good with modern weapons because of my military training. I'm good infiltrating uh, for sure. Mm-hmm. So I, I'd basically be like a like a special forces sort of type of character. You know? I mean, he'd um, also be the one that would be like, we send you into the compound to hack the Gibson so we can get in. And, you know, honestly, that's fine in this game because yeah. ultimately you can just grab a rifle and shoot dudes and it does enough yeah. damage. Oh, yeah, because yeah. I'm like, I can shoot a beam at someone. That beam does 3d6 or I can grab a rifle. That rifle does 3d6. Who cares? Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah, so... The, I'm not too limited because of my powers, but what's interesting is over time, after I level up, who knows what sort of abilities I'll I'll be getting. Oh, yeah, because you could just 
like mutate into just about anything. A beautiful lizard butterfly. Well, I mean, yeah, you could have so many diaphanous wings. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. It, oh yeah. So uh, we don't have a frontline bruiser. Right I'm now? probably the closest. Yeah, you I mean, you've closest? got the most SDC. I do have, a, but not a huge, I'm not a crazy yeah. SDC monster like you can build in this no, game. No, we don't have like yeah. a, a rock guy or a metal guy yeah. or someone with invulnerability. Yeah, but but uh, mm-hmm. but he, he is basically the front line because he just basically yeah. goes, hey, the fight's right here where this huge cloud of darkness is. And then inside this huge cloud of darkness, a huge elephant man. Yeah. Oh, no, what could be in that 15 foot tall cloud of darkness? Technically, it's a 30 foot tall cloud. I checked to see how tall it was because I was worried that I might be bigger than the clouds of darkness I can make. <laughs> <laughs> just making a cloud of darkness and sticking up out the top. Hi. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm just a floating head. Uh, My cloud of darkness only goes as far as the lobby. (laughs) So let's talk about the system as a whole um, and how it plays and particularly how it lends to character development. Not necessarily advancement and like leveling up, but how does your character kind of change over time? Well, it's going to be the same as it is with most superhero games where it depends a lot on the DM Mm -hmm. to let you get away with developing your powers. Yeah. If, mm-hmm. your D- if your DM spends most of the time saying, you know, you have energy expulsion light, what does that do? It can shoot a beam of light that does 2d6 damage, or it can blind a target, reducing their, their to hit by 8. Then, you know, that's boring. But if you're like, okay, but can I shoot it through a giant magnifying lens that I pulled out of a, a lighthouse and use it to melt through a wall? And they should be like, yes, because that sounds rad. Um, right. As opposed to, no, because it does what it says in the book. No, see, because the book says. Yeah. So superhero rule games of cool. Li- yeah, superhero games are entirely dependent on the rule of cool. Yeah. You have to have it because otherwise Cyclops sucks, you know, like his, <laughs> like his X-Men. If, if his power is I could shoot a beam out of my, my eyes, he sucks. But if he can use it to like pull vault because it's kind of a cohesive beam, that's rad. Like mm-hmm. the, the more tricks that you can do with the few powers you have, the radder you, you are and the more fun you're going to have. Very little of that supports in the book beyond sidebars suggesting that the DM should do that. Uh, and that's but that's good enough because that's all you really need that that imagination access yeah. and i i really like in this system we'll talk about it a little little bit the the experience points table mm-hmm. really gives you a good idea of how to um kind of play your character to try to play the experience system uh so that way you can choose to do certain uh character choices that will reward you with XP. Instead of trying to fight your way through everything, you can get XP for uh, resolving something peacefully or whatever. So you can you can go different routes uh, to try to maximize your your experience gain as well. Yeah, there's like a list of things that you can do. Uh, you know, selflessly sacrifice yourself or put yourself in harm's way to save a friend. Mm-hmm. Uh, use a skill in a useful fashion, um, and and it's useful. In certain senses, I, I'm not a huge fan of XP systems in general. I just tend to like le- letting the party level up when they mm-hmm. should. But um, but in in this case, uh, it's nice because this is the kind of game where it would be really easy to forget to give out XP. Yeah. And having that charted out is simple. You can, in yeah. fact, this is the kind of game where you could almost let players do their own XP. Mm-hmm. Well, speaking of XP, how about we go ahead and get into our character advancement segment and take it up a level? Sure. Take it up a level. Take it up a level. So in this segment, we talk about how character advancement or leveling up works in the system. So how does a character level up in this game and what kind of perks do you get when that happens? Baseline for pretty much anyone, regardless of what you're doing, for the most part, you're looking at getting a little bit more of your hit points. A D6. You're going to get uh, your uh, skills will go up by whatever percentage they go up. Three to five. <laughs> uh, and then it's going to really depend on the powers you took. Uh, something like magic, when you level up, has spells have durations and uh, effects and ranges and things mm-hmm. like that that depend on level and actually care about it. As well as some powers, like there can be an energy expulsion power that actually gets better as you level up. Mm-hmm. Most of them do. They get little ping, uh, pings of damage every couple levels or so. Yeah, yeah, so you'll get a few extra D6s here and there. For the most part, though, when you level up, you're not looking at much. Your base 
competency is going to be the same Mm -hmm. for 99% of characters. I say probably the biggest perk is the hand to hand. Level yeah, it does. Yeah, you get little bonuses to strike to strike, parry, and dodge, and more attacks proper uh, uh, per melee round. The it, this isn't really a game about leveling, and the leveling perks don't really feel necessary. I mean, the, like we've been talking about, Ryan happened to roll a very rare uh, event where his character is going to gain powers as he levels up, which sounds really neat and sounds like it's going to reward people on the leveling system. But look at what his character started with. He's got chameleon and. We're done. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's which means he's just kind of instead of being front loaded like everyone else, he's it's almost like he's just from a different game. Yeah. This game probably could have done well by just saying, hey, when you get to level five, you get another minor superpower. Yeah. That, that would have been a smart way to do it. Mm-hmm. I know why they didn't. And it's because, you know, Captain America has been around for 90 years or whatever it is at this point. He hasn't really gained any new abilities that whole time. Right. If that's not a superhero thing a, a lot of the time. Yeah. And I think. I mean, the way you can kind of get around that is if you're looking at a system that has something that lets you get tricks. Like if I have energy expulsion fire getting to the point where like I'm level five and now I can do things like shape my fire into things. Yeah. You're like, oh, OK, cool. And there are systems that did that that are contemporary to this thing. Like uh, Marvel Super Heroes role playing did that. Power tricks were an important part of the system. Um, and, and I feel like that could have been in there. But ultimately, you don't most characters in this game leveling up doesn't matter yeah yeah that's very true you sound so disappointed like you just realized that right now no i mean mean, you could start a campaign with everyone at level 15 and unlike a lot of games we're like oh i started a game with everyone in D &D at level Mm -hmm. 20 you're like that's ridiculous this you go great you're pretty much the same except way more competent with skills Mm -hmm. yeah Mm-hmm. It really leveling up when when I was playing it, it was when's our next attack per melee? Can yeah. we can how can we get to that level quicker? Because the attacks per melee is huge. Plus one attack per melee means you get to do an extra action within that fifteen second time period. Mm-hmm. And it and, also means if you outnumber actions to whoever you're fighting, yeah. if I have four and you have five and I use all four of mine on defense, you've got an attack that I cannot defend against. Yeah. I mean, if anything, we didn't talk about the combat system very much, but games where it's possible to stack attacks per melee round are one of my least favorite game designs because it's possible, as soon as it's available, it's the only relevant option. Is mm-hmm. going going more than your opponent becomes the well, only yeah. action yeah. advantage is always king. Yeah, it's it's the it's the best possible thing you can get. And that means it's in inherently an imbalanced factor because if you're not building for it you're building wrong right luckily in this game it's really hard to build for it if you're rolling randomly so oh yeah yeah but anyway you're right when you're leveling it is the thing you're watching for Mm -hmm. and one of the things about leveling in this game that i'm really disappointed about is every single power level or every single power type uh, has a different experience chart, right? <laughs> yes, it does. Yeah, there's there's not just like, oh, I gained experience, and when everyone hits like 10,000, we go up. It's like, okay, well, experiments have a different table than mutants, which have a different table than psionics. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah, so some some will level up at from level 1 to 2 at like 2,000, some will be 3,000, some will be 2,300, and it, it's just all over the place, and it... It almost seems like, uh, oh, if you're a wizard, you're, you're going to level up slower because wizards are super powerful later on. And yeah, it's one of those things where Gygax did it, so he did it, even yeah. though it, Gygax also did front load power levels. on Like, wizards suck at, at low level, but they get powerful at high level in the older games. But in this game... It, those those numbers don't translate to the the power the effective power levels of those archetypes at yeah. all. Yeah. They feel entirely arbitrary. It really does. Well, that's just. I mean, I, I mean, as a GM, like, how do you keep track of that, and how do you like balance encounters for that? <laughs> you don't. You don't. You, you don't. don't. <laughs> how, house. This you is don't. this is my house rule number one in Palladium games. You level up when I say you level up. Oh, that's my house rule in literally every game yeah. I've ever run. I have never kept track of XP in any system. Wow. I have always just said, all right, everybody level up. <laughs> I have never played a Palladium game where we haven't done individual XP. But every other game that I have played, we don't keep track of individual XP. <laughs> that's so weird. Yeah, It I, is. 
I abandoned it pretty much when I stopped playing with my old high school crew uh, because I was running the games for a while there. And the first thing I realized was one of the things I hated back when I played RPGs with my old high school crew was uh, they, they'd all slavishly adhere to that little how to give out XP chart. And they'd be like, oh, you just did an interesting story thing. Here's 200 XP once yeah. all game night. And then they would forget that that's a thing. And, and you'd spend the rest of the night going, oh, I just did something cool and interesting and I didn't get a reward for it. And it started cr- to cr- create divisiveness uh, in, in the party it, just because the DM was busy. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. this, is, this isn't this is necessary. And, and my reward is that I level up a day before someone else does. And that's I, I don't feel like that's a good feeling I'm getting. And, it, or the, and so I translated that out to my players. And I was like, you just level up when I say you do. Now no one's fighting about it. And no one feels really bad when they don't get gain a level or whatever, and it's just going to be easier that way. Yeah, because it's always the worst when you you choose a class that that sounds really cool, but it's the highest like progression mm-hmm. that you need to get to, and then everybody's leveling up before you every single level, and then at points you're going to be like two sessions behind, three sessions behind. Yeah, before you get to the next level, even though they don't matter too much, it still feels good to. Oh yeah, it's still just plateau. a a feel bad situation when you look around and everyone's like, "Yay, I got level up! I get to you know erase things and put higher numbers on my sheet." And you just go, "I don't." Yeah, mm-hmm. and you know it made sense back when D and D was being designed because the classes were strictly more powerful than each other, and it was on purpose. Yeah, like uh, you could play in second edition D and D. Yeah, you could play a fighter, thief, mage, and get all the powers of a fighter, a thief, and a mage, and it cost you like nine thousand XP to get all three of them to level two. So, yeah, it made sense because otherwise you were obliterating three other potential roles within the party. Mm-hmm. But nowadays, most games are designed with level by level parity between the available options. Um, you know, a, a, a first level Shadowrun character is pretty much, the, well, not, I know Shadowrun yeah. is never levels, but whatever. A basic, a basic character is usually the same as another one for the most part. And so when you're like, well, this one takes more XP to level up because they have to amass more wisdom. You're like, no, don't, don't do that. Just stick to the mechanics, buddy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Would it be beneficial to have character events spent in mind during character creation in Heroes Unlimited? Uh, if you're building your character without randomly rolling, uh, still no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in my in my mind, I look at it and go, if you managed to random into someone that cares about level, whether it's a straight wizard or a... A uh, weird mutant or a psychic, I think, can, can yeah, sometimes count. There's basically mm-hmm. like one psychic version, one wizard version, and that weird random mutation that you got. Yeah. If nobody gets that, I just like, okay, great. We're all just going to level up one at a time. Exactly. And honestly, I feel like I would just start my game at level 15 if anyone else was... Mm-hmm using one of those things where they had to care what level they were. I mean, there are classes that none of us, or power archetype sets that none of us rolled, which have even less to do with leveling than the ones that we rolled did. Uh, Notably, if you have a robot suit or a power armor suit, you don't actually have to use a a skill of pilot power armor if you're wearing one. You're just really good at it, and so you just, you you act like a normal character. Uh, And that means that none of your skills matter at all for the purposes of combat. Yeah. And your, your robot suit doesn't get more powerful level. Uh, which means you do nothing but gain hit points. And if you yeah. rolled robot as in, I am an actual robot, you don't even get to roll, like, get your extra hit point D6 yeah. per level. There are character classes where, where leveling literally means nothing. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what a bad game. Front loading. It's just front loading. Uh-huh. This is a bad game, right? <laughs> I mean, you know what? I'm yeah. not going to argue with uh, you. Yeah, no one's arguing with you. It's, it's a game that... that I mean, this is like you're talking to a room full of smokers. Like, smoking's bad for you. Yeah, yeah, I got yeah, it. Sure is. But if you'll yeah. excuse me, I need to smoke. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, and I think that there's always, like, a sentimentality to a game that you played for a long mm-hmm. time and, mm-hmm. like, have really good memories of. And, you know, and like we said, we have all of those house rules. So you're like, my experience was really great with it. Yeah. Like, I mean, reading rules as written, this is a trash game. <laughs> I've never but, had like, a campaign of Heroes Unlimited. You could have fun. I've never had a campaign of Heroes Unlimited last more than three sessions, and that's on purpose. Oh, wow. Uh, because advancement is boring, and eventually your character gets boring because there's nothing new that's going to happen to them. Well, yeah, after the you know fourth session of you going like, these are the same powers, I'm using them in the same way, mm-hmm. eventually you just go, hey, can I roll a new guy? Yeah. I just want new powers. I well, want to play with the toy. Once you realize the fun part of Heroes Unlimited is character creation, and then the first day out of, of being a new adventurer, the game opens up in a way that that is actually pretty great, which is one-shots. You use this for one-shots. 
You make oh, a fun man, character. I can't even imagine. Because uh, my friends and I, <laughs> we have only done campaigns with Heroes Unlimited. Oh. <laughs> and um, back in the day, we had a campaign that lasted uh, well over three years where Dang. we, we yeah. rotated GMs uh, in the same game world with the same characters, except for some of mine died more than others. <laughs> hmm. Um but it it was a continuous story with different villains and and different arch nemesises and all that sort of stuff and and we didn't really care about the level advancement as much uh we just cared about how how do our current characters fit into this new story situation yeah uh, and which, I, I you know i can totally get behind that it just never worked out for me i yeah. mean to to give you an example of how i can get behind that my rifts game lasted for exactly 5 years Oh yeah, because because it started in seventh grade and ended in twelfth. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that if I mean, if you can't gain new powers and stuff, I feel like after a while that would get kind of boring if you don't have the kind of GM that can kind of build a story around those things mm-hmm. to constantly yeah. challenge yeah. them. You're You've not wrong. got to really lean into the role playing at that point yeah because when you look at a game like you know a dungeons and dragons or something like that you go yeah okay i've got whatever powers but then i gain a level and i get new powers Mm -hmm. and i just i'm continually getting new toys to play with Mm -hmm. in a game where you get all your toys to start with and then that's it at some point you're going to be like well i've played with this enough yeah Mm mm-hmm yeah, I think I think this game lends itself very well to leaning hard into telling comic book style storylines where you mm-hmm. can have those one shots and 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 be awesome with your characters or you could have multi issue things where your your same characters are doing all these cool different things and the toys that you're going to play with is the story toys. Uh, yeah, that's we're fine going too. into space. We're going to a different dimension. We got to sell these hostess fruit pies. Yeah, you could do that too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you could travel back to the past and and save the whales and bring them back to the present. Oh yeah, and then like ride them. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Um. Yeah. Did, and turn them into wolf dolphins. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Wolfins. Wolfins. Well, I can wolfins. identify plants and fruit pies. <laughs> <laughs> and we've come full circle. Oh yeah. Well, I think that that does it for this game, hopefully. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry, everybody who was hoping that we'd come out of this being all like, this game's amazing. <laughs> I still think it's amazing. Oh, no, yes. I mean, I could, it's, you know, I, like I could see having fun with it yeah. uh, for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, we'll, uh, we'll, run a, we'll, we'll, we'll run a game of it for you. Yep. Tell you what, next time we're all at a convention, we'll run a, a, a Heroes Unlimited game, and uh, and we'll have your character built so you don't have to do that part. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> no, we'll you'll, have, you'll have to build now. your character, but just not skills. And oh, then there the you next go. Time, That's good. The next convention will actually play. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yep. <laughs> no, you know what? Not everything is for everyone. This is not an Amelia game, <laughs> no. and that's fine. Mm-hmm. No, it's not. <laughs> fine, that is. It's not fine. No. Well, thank you so much, guys, for joining us for our Heroes Unlimited character creation. Do you want to remind everyone once again where they can find you and what sort of stuff you guys are up to? Absolutely. John's home address. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know it. You can find us at SystemMasteryPodcast.com. That is where all of our material goes up. Our podcasts are, well, my written articles and you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, basically any social media thing as System Mastery. Uh, we've got our own Discord where if you check our Twitter, it's uh, pinned there. We've got a lot of awesome conversations going on there. Great community. Mm-hmm. And uh, you can support us at patreon.com slash System Mastery. Mm-hmm. And that will unlock tons of bonus content depending yeah. on what level you support us. On at. average, we make seven bonus episodes a month. Nice. So, so please stop on by and uh, and join the fun. Well, thank you both again for sitting down to do this with us. And Absolutely. Thank you everyone for tuning in and sticking with us. Mm-hmm. 
Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts and guests, or even find some of our character sheets. Character Creation Cast can be found on Twitter at CreationCast. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia Antrim, and I can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Our other host, Ryan Bolter, can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast it originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Amelia Antrim. Further information for the game system used and today's guests can also be found in the show notes. If you like the game systems discussed and wish to purchase them, links to the products can be found in the show notes. Also check our notes or the website for cool stuff to go with each character, like dice or mixtapes. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We'll see you next time. Gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit oneshotpodcast.com where you will find other great shows like Warda. Warda is an original fantasy actual play podcast created by Ali Grauer and Drew Marzieski. It's one part Game of Thrones. Two parts Downton Abbey, served on the rocks with a twist of Agatha Christie. Discover magic, mystery, and more than a little socio-political commentary along the way. The city holds thousands of stories. What will yours be? That's too wholesome, Ryan. I know, I apologize. Almost. Almost. My apologies, I'm a little under the weather, but I'll try and swing my mic out of the way if anything happens. At least you sound fine. Oh yeah, that's uh, that's an industry standard. <laughs> Oh. I have to I ha- if I, if I want to make that money. Yeah, I'm dying inside. But <laughs> oh, he's 50 percent Dayquil by volume at this point. <laughs> yeah, at the moment, I I look like I have two black eyes and no one has punched me. Oh, my. <laughs> but I'll take care of that. Yes. Thanks, John. <laughs> <laughs> at that rate, Amelia would have, what, 18 podcasts? <laughs> and, well, I mean, if I've, I've got four in one year, so. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good rate. That's, yeah, that's a that's a reasonable that is progression. Unsustainable is what that is. <laughs> <laughs> you just add more on the Patreon. That's all you have to do. Yes. Yep. Well, it's just Amelia's law. The number of podcasts will double every two years, mm-hmm. so it becomes rapidly unsustainable. <laughs> yes. Within fourteen cycles, you'll have more podcasts than there are people, <laughs> unless we clone me and make several Amelias. Nice. Mm. I see nothing wrong with this. That's a good plan. There's nothing that could go wrong here. (laughs) What could possibly go wrong? That definitely extends the logical end point. Look, I've seen the first 20 minutes of multiplicity and nothing could go wrong. (laughs) Is this the Grey Goose scenario, but the end result is all podcasts? How many of them are like true crime? At At least least 30%. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And all of them have kissing. (laughs) (laughs) I found the true culprit of this crime and I kissed them. (laughs) (laughs) You solve crimes by kissing people. That's... It was a small, unassuming town in Central America tonight, and everyone was kissing. Crime kisses. <laughs> yeah, Ooh, I hope Dam's okay. Good That's enough. fine. All right, <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be the first one. <laughs> uh-huh. Hell, damn it! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, our, I don't know. If folks at home don't know this. Our podcast is super blue. <laughs> it is. It's very good. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. very good. <laughs> and, and we're making it weekly for five years, and it's really hard to stop. <laughs> Getting in front of Mike and not just swearing a storm is so difficult for me now. Yeah. So apologies in advance. You, you know, know how many people I we have that-, that, like, at the end of recording are like just start a stream of swears. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, John stop. Adamus was uh, infamous for for not swearing a- once during the whole recording. And then it was like a solid two minutes afterwards. Yeah, it was <laughs> we should have gotten that out of our system in advance. Yep. <laughs>
Except there is a superpower, I believe, in the main book that mm, gives you a mega damage. <laughs> that would be insane. I, I'm pretty sure it, it, it would insta kill everything. Everything it hit. It's like you you're a mega damage being, and and you you get mega damage instead of SDC. Oh, oh, that's um supernatural physical strength. Gives uh, you supernatural yeah, strength. Yeah, well, that's that one. Yeah. But there's one I think that was like literally called mega damage. Oh, oh, interesting. Maybe it's in a source book. I assume it's in a source book. Now I have to find it. Okay. Car- car- <laughs> okay. Well, now this will it's haunt cool. me until well, the end of my days. No, we're, we're all hanging out. It's fine. It's all good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not. In, I guess it's not in the main book. Yeah, there is the supernatural strength, which uh, allows you to... Super yeah, punch people. Super punch. Yeah, I was yeah, trying to figure out you a different chart for what your damage is. I was is. trying to figure out what you're mm-hmm. talking about. Because like, there's a few, the, the new ones that are in there that feel kind of excessive are supernatural PS, alter physical structure, plasma feels a little. Oh, alter physical structure, plasma was amazing. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. it's just like, hey, what if fire, but more? Yeah. It's what if yeah. fire, but you were better at it. Yeah. Then again, that's what like a lot of the powers are. When you look at something like, what's the difference between alter physical structure, stone and metal? Uh, metal's better. <laughs> it's just the better version uh-huh. of it. Yep. Okay, so I mean, that just means Palladium has come down real hard on saying that Colossus is better than the thing, <laughs> and that's fine. I'm fine with that. Hmm. I mean, that only that's only true if you if you assume that the thing is made of rocks. Mm-hmm. Well, he is. He's made of a rocky substance. He's made of <laughs> orange rocks. <laughs> uh, I think he has strength. a rock like exterior. It looks like supernatural strength does not give you the damage for mega damage. No, it, 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 and it couldn't because mega damage. The rules and rifts say that mega damage, if it hits a non mega damage target, yeah. kills it instantly. No, yeah. it's a hundred SDC. No, that's if you want to run the conversion. The actual rule is it, any number of SDC is obliterated by one mega damage. Yeah, unless you're unless you're dealing with something that's got thousands of SDC, like a tank or something. Or, or I think it's actually hundreds because I believe there's uh, some super abilities that like give you hundreds of SDC, and I think it points out saying, "Oh, by the oh. way." Uh, yeah, if you were to go to Rift's Earth, this would be mega damage. Well, yeah. yeah. The the whole thing is normally uh, one mega damage is one hundred SDC damage. Yes, and but no amount of SDC can inflict one point of mega damage. No, it right. can. It says in the main Rift's book that if yeah. you deal one hundred or more oh, SDC with a in single one attack, hit, yeah, with yeah. a single attack. Sorry, I was thinking in terms of like shooting a machine gun in a tank, for example. It will never oh, yeah. do anything. No, um, but. But yeah, the uh, but all of them translate to to their MDC equivalents. If you go to an MDC planet, so if you go to Robotech or to Rifts, mm-hmm. they will start they will start doing MDC. Well, the weird thing is with the conversion book, it's not like oh you had eight hundred SDC, now you have eight MD. It's no, you, now you have eight hundred MDC yeah, because they want it to be a superpower still. Yeah, yeah. so it it, uh, it translates almost directly. You just change the S to the to an M. Uh, like Powers ca- Unlimited Two doesn't have extra superpowers. My uh, that's hilarious. Wow, powers unlimited too. That's very limited powers. <laughs> it's it's a bunch of extra classes that you could be. Oh, interesting. Um, hmm. including one of my favorites, the the Gestalt hero, where <laughs> you literally play as multiple people, or your group oh, so it's plays like as multiple people. Second generation Shazam type stuff. Yeah, and then okay. and then they all combine into one person, and that that person is the superhero. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you're without powers. I think. Yeah, that makes sense. It's a uh, it's a uh, Shazam when it's the Shazam family because oh, that's, okay. that's happened a few times where he's like all the kids in the orphanage turn into the one guy now. Oh, OK. I can't. Can you think of any other ones off the top of your head? I'm trying to think of any ones because I know there have been. I, I mean, mean, obviously, you normally think Voltron. But. Yeah, I mean, the other I mean, thinking of like heroes or villains, uh, Fenris works that way. Like they don't work unless they're holding hands. Yeah, I mean, you can say like Wonder Twins, but it's not like they combine into one person. No, but the all Fen- I can think of is there is a what if issue in <laughs> that was what if the Hulk had Bruce Banner's brain, and at the very end he combines forms with him, Professor X, and uh, Mister Fantastic. It's very weird. It's a very weird comic. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love the idea of a group of people who have one. Oh, wait, there's that um, th- that weird one on on. Uh, wow, shoot, what's that show called? Uh, Legion. The two people who have oh, the who, oh yeah, 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 just share a body. Yeah. So here's the uh, the Heroes Unlimited GM's guide. Oh, Ooh, there is one. Yep. I literally have never heard of that till now. Yeah, that is. Uh, when was this released? I think it was only second edition stuff. This was June 1999. Holy cow. Wow, oh, there you go. I, that's the other weird thing is like, like aliens and villains unlimited have never had second edition re-releases. They're they're effectively they're revised 
Um, are they? Force, are they there's, revised? But there's not Aliens Unlimited, and then there's Aliens Unlimited Revised, which is the second edition version. Oh, wow. Okay. It's uh, like, you know, you have Rifts, and then the Rifts Ultimate Edition. But yeah, but Rifts just, Ultimate Edition doesn't you, change you any rules. You know what book they never changed? This one right here. The Compendium of Ancient Weapons, Armor, <laughs> so, uh, and Castles. Oh, I have a friend who was obsessed, who, when I was a kid, rather, I had a friend who was obsessed with that, and then the modern weapons equivalent of it. Well, yep. yeah, they had a weapon source book that mm-hmm. was just, like, a big, thick book of every weapon they've printed. Yeah, all yeah. of them do. It, it's what, both books are effectively pointless. You just scour through them until you find the one weapon that does the most damage. Yep, it was uh, this one and the contemporary, or compendium of contemporary weapons uh, mm-hmm. that we used all the time. But yeah, this one doesn't even use, like, the stats for palladium stuff. It's like... Parry two, tech dex zero, throw two, damage two, and then you have mm-hmm. to go to a chart, and then you have to convert <laughs> that chart to the actual palladium system. Wow! Bonuses. Yeah, I, I think I think if when it comes to inessential palladium properties, I might have the worst ones. Uh, they are three books that are deck plans to the giant battleships of the Macross universe. Oh my goodness! In palladium. Well, that's good and if that's, you're and playing that system. I mean, here's the thing: there, it's just deck plans. <laughs> And it's it's only the ultra huge battleships. So well, you know. it's yeah, I mean it's it's really useful if you happen to be like I, I guess invading them, but three three whole books of that and most of the battleships are almost identical. Yeah. So it's and it's you a can't very just weird make that up yourself. I mean yeah, well, I mean well, you, you could. You but, could, but, oh, but here's three whole going books. Against the history of the anime and the mangas and yeah, All that sort of stuff. My anime. <laughs> you don't it's, want to anger people. I don't know. I I bought them at a used store by my grandparents' old beach house, and they're still sitting in a box in my garage. and And they are they are far and away. They were good reading for while I was stuck on a beach for a whole week. Um, it was rainy. Uh, <laughs> and uh, but but they are so critically inessential. Yeah. There's not a single rule for what you, for anything that you would possibly play. Mm-hmm. It's just lists of deck plans. But see, I can I can see that as being interesting instead of useful. Uh, which oh yeah, that's that's mostly how I think of Palladium these days at all. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I mean, quite very, toilet very reading. Fair, very fair. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. okay. Here's the order of the list that it's yeah. In. Yeah, um, it goes Reggie, Jay Z, Tupac, and Biggie. <laughs> <laughs> That's the wrong list. Wait, I feel like you forgot about list. Dre. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> hi. Why is there a stat for coma length? <laughs> uh, well, yeah. maybe you went into a coma. I- <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Well, oh. hey, you know, if you don't have anything, at least you can be a jerk about it. Right. No, but I promised I would be nice. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I promised. I, I made two. you make dirge strangle. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, see, that's where promises take you. They take you to incredible places. To a man whose family got eaten by a tyrannosaurus. <laughs> it was. I think it was a pack of trained tyrannosaurus. It was a pack of well, because yeah, because his love that he left at the altar uh, was breeding tyrannosaurus. Yep. I'm not listening. This might be my backstory. <laughs> <laughs> Oh gosh! Filling the silence. Tracking, tracking sounds good. This is yeah. This is the best part of the show. Uh-huh. Is where we all pick skills. You guys must make really liberal use of that audacity thing that can just knock chunks of silence out of there. I do that all the time. Yeah, yeah God knows. I Truncate either. silence to point five seconds. Yeah, that makes everybody sound like they're geniuses. Uh huh. <laughs> it's so fantastic. Wow, you guys banter so well. You just bounce right off each we other. We sure do. Yep. I never use it, John. We're that we're that good. We are that. We're good. so yeah. quick witted and and sexy, and <laughs> smart, good dancers, mm-hmm. and I have a face made for podcast. <laughs> well, we don't have an official language, so you can pretty much put whatever you want. That's then true. we have God's language, mm-hmm. but it's just another one of the languages that that's spoken here. It's not the official language. Yeah, yeah. it's a Nokia land of origin. God's language. Is it just tongues? <laughs> Oh my goodness. How come wilderness survival is not under wilderness? It's an espionage skill. God. <laughs> Ryan? There's, there's a deep joy in my soul watching someone come to Palladium New. Oh, and having to learn it on a podcast? This is nuts. <laughs> I wouldn't wish this on anyone. This is, this is so much worse than all five hours. 
I know. See, that's the thing is that like you gave me so much crap for like yeah. making you do L five R, and it it was not that bad, was it? <laughs> no, L five R is deeply playable. Really the, the problems with L five R is that it's like an edge lord thing. Mm-hmm. It's oh, it's yeah. so much fun. I love that game. I mean, what a what a bad game. <laughs> like. I, I understand the garbage of it, but, like, it was so fun to create characters for it. Oh, no. I mean, You, you don't you, understand the garbage of it, well, you, but you will when you listen to my new podcast. That's true. <laughs> you, guys, you guys are perfectly fine. I, I, here we are rattling off Palladium stats. We're in no place to judge people for liking L5. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, shoot. I don't want to miss an option. It's- and I don't want to miss an option. Here we go. I found it. Yeah. Okay, I'm really annoyed because the mutants don't have the, like, roll for your education step. <laughs> no, they, it, well, isn't that just if you're a mutant animal no, or something? No, 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 it's creating the mutant super character. Step one, the usual. Uh, hit points, attributes, alignment. Oh, there it is. Skills and exp, exp okay. If I just read it, I guess. Yeah, if you just read the book, you realize <laughs> just infallible. Just don't be a mutant animal because that will take no. over your skill table and replace it with an animal skill no, package. I don't want mutant animal. 100% no. Also, I know we already said burning bush, but if I could just suggest blaze it. <laughs> hey, that's already one of our bonus content characters. <laughs> we made two G.I. Joe guys for a G.I. Joe role playing game once named Blaze It and Smoke Trees. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> that's the kind of content you could expect from us at System. Come on down. <laughs> Yay. My waveforms are beautiful. Hold on. Let me try talking. Hold on. John, Let try me talking. try talking. There we go. John, give us a couple of bars of pit bulls so I can test out our levels. Mr. Worldwide. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Everything was looking good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Let me get 10 seconds of silence. Now That's 10 seconds so of loud, fun. weird noises. It's a very short 10 seconds. <laughs> no, you do them simultaneously. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Doing this for years. We just, we just like to make mouth noises. Just mm-hmm. Loud, weird mouth noises. Mm-hmm. God. Yes, indeed. Hang on, I got a pizza crust here. I can chew it. Oh, oh please. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That's not chewing. <laughs> well, you've never seen me chew. <laughs> I have. <laughs> it is the most disturbing thing in the world. But I still want to go to breakfast with the guy. <laughs> That's how charming I am. Mm-hmm. True love. <laughs> you know, when you have enough skill in deception or disguise and it's, uh, it's all ventriloquism. I make it so that it mm. seems like the guy next to me is chewing real gross. <laughs> Truth be told, I, I just want to go to breakfast, and it's socially awkward to go to breakfast yourself at ten at night. <laughs> you know, if a if an eleven foot tall elephant uh, can pass as a human, uh, you can go to breakfast alone. You can go to breakfast. <laughs> Believe in yourself. <laughs> exactly. Oh God. I'm worried what the people at a Denny's at eleven p.m. will think of me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. As you should be. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> Those are the real people that you gotta you gotta please. Those are the people you gotta pull weight with. Yeah. <laughs> right. Eleven p.m. Denny's people. Oh my The real movers and shakers. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, now that we got all of that out of our way, how about we start the next episode? Okay. All right. So I'll give a little bit of science, and then we will get into it. Yes, yeah. goop of some sort. Mm-hmm. Uh, so her some sort of jade egg. <laughs> <laughs> I think we broke her. <laughs> <sighs> that happened way before I was in like hour one. That's true. <laughs> 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 Let's be clear here, character John. My my Riff's character was named Dahmer because I thought Jeffrey Dahmer was an interesting person to name to, to name a character after. Wow. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> yeah, he was a good guy. He was a good guy. I, I wasn't playing some edge lord cat murderer or something. He was he was a cyber knight and everything. But hey, I thought that name was great. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and reveal something to you that I don't think I've revealed anywhere else before. Oh my god, it's an exclusive right here. Yeah, it's exclusive. <laughs> my character's name. Mm-hmm. Uh. He normally went by Paco, 
but his actual name was Parentesco Espada, which is blood sword when I looked it up in the <laughs> Spanish to English dictionary. <laughs> so oh, as you can tell, 13 year old me was on that same wavelength. Yeah, we're, we're uh, fine. We're, 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 uh, we're, we're, we're cool, good friends that yeah. had not met yet. We're Riff's brothers. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, that, that sounds like old school palladium. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Orion, do you have it. anything that you want to confess? <laughs> <laughs> confessions of a rifts player <laughs> my goodness I, aside from the, the the five months of like every week we played and every week a new character of mine died <laughs> uh and it was only my character of course i don't know i think my my friends were had something out for me uh <laughs> If you're looking for an answer as to why we're at SystemMasteryPodcast.com and not at, you know, OneShot.com uh, or OneShot Podcast or whatever that website is, uh, you can tweet at our boss, James, uh, whose Twitter I do not remember. You are on the website now. You are. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I you forgot. Can't I can't make have, that joke I have... anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's cool. I can still make it. <laughs> I, I still make it. <laughs> James, I luck saw on the slack at one point too he's like please for the love of god make it stop <laughs> well i think that was because we were like messaging him about it Jay, hey, well James. and i think it was right after gen con too where we kept making that joke at him mm -hmm. too yes. <laughs> <laughs> so i i see no reason to let a good joke die just because we we're on the website i haven't checked it in a while when they first put it up put us up they had our bios with the wrong names on top of them which was oh beautiful great yeah Perfect. I do not know if that's been fixed yet or not. I'm pretty sure it has. I've been scouring oh, okay. the site and looking for errors and stuff, and I don't think there's uh, anything weird going on. I wasn't even sure that was an error. I thought people might just be they messing, just with, messing us. with us yeah, yeah. For, for years of, ha of us having messed with them. Uh, ironically, the website, everything was broken at one point except for your page. <laughs> <laughs> it was like the that's... only page that was working. <laughs> That's been part of our joke for the past several years is every time the one shot site goes down, we're like, but please, if you're looking for quality podcast material, come on down to System Mastery Podcast, which has never gone down. We've <laughs> never failed. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this was during the website upgrade. Yeah. Oh, gosh. We're not really network members. We're more like network friends. 